We are here. This feels right with Will Harris. Will, thank you so much for being a guest on TFR. This feels right. Thanks, Joel. It's a it's a pleasure to be here, and it certainly it feels right, man. Thanks a lot for having me on. <laughs> and scene, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we're talking about this is great. We're talking about such an important topic. We're talking about value and selling your value. Um, but you know, value has become in a lot of ways maybe a bit of a overused word. And um, so you know, you have so many years of experience um, and how you came to this. But let's talk about first about the word value and and what's your perspective on this, Will? How do you see that? Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. I think we hear it a lot and how to build value. And you know, it has kind of become this cliche. And when we started talking about this a month ago, I had an idea of what value meant. Uh, to me, and I started to go down this journey and um, uh, self-reflection and doing a little bit of additional discovery of what really that word value meant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where I originally started with it in terms of from a sales perspective, I think that, you know, from where where we were a month ago when we first had this conversation to where I am today, I, I keep reminding myself that value means a lot of different things. And, you know, today we're, we're going to unpack some of that. And yeah. uh, hopefully there's some, you know, there's some good examples how, you know, young salespeople or experienced salespeople can start adding value to the conversations that they're having today if they're not already doing that. Well, so what, so what, what gets in the way, like you talk about young salespeople as an example, what gets in the way of them maybe focusing on offering value versus, you know, just, I don't know, the checkbook or making the sale, yeah. like what, what gets in the way? Yeah, I, I think that we're so focused on your success in sales, right? In terms of, hey, I'm going to hit my target, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to earn that commission check that you are looking over, you know, the conversations that you need to have directly that are right in front of you. And, you know, I look back on, you know, my sales career and I started in sales at a very, very young age, uh, like probably when I was about 13, 13 years old. But, you know, my first full time uh, sales role was as a as a beer rep. And I, I told you this uh, story before, but I think that it's a good way to be reminded of why value and I'll give examples of value is, is important to young salespeople and to start very young of building value with your uh, your clients and as part of your sales process. So as a beer rep, we've got, you know, um, I love being out with people. I, I, when I was young, I thought people will buy from me because they like me. Right. And, and because I'm going to entertain them and bring them to sporting events and, you know, do all of this really cool stuff with, uh, with my clients and potential clients. And that's, what's going to give me business. And, you know, you would spend all this time entertaining and being out and, you know, being this, likable guy that I thought that being a salesperson was all about. Right. And yet I just, I continue to lose business. You know, I would, <laughs> I'd be spending all of this time and energy and it wasn't manifesting itself in, um, in sales. It wasn't mm -hmm. correlating. And for me, even at that young age, I was pretty disheartening. And it was also disheartening because I took it personally you know, this is, this is will of like at 21, 22 years old. I'm, you know, right. I'm 40, 40 this year. Year. That was, you know, a long, long time ago and it was pretty disheartening. And what brought me on to, you know, bringing value is that my career kind of morphed and changed. So I went from being at, you know, being at bars, being at, you know, the, the LCBO and beer stores all the time, face to face with people um, to being in, and this is where we met being on inside sales, like talking mm -hmm. to people, car dealers for that matter, all across the country. Yeah. There wasn't any, hey, we've got tickets to the Leafs Habs game tonight. Uh, why don't we come and have a night out? And then hopefully, miraculously, you'll put my beer on tap and right. uh, I'll grow my business that way. So being um, in inside sales and selling to dealers, dealers, for those that don't know, are very tough customers. Whereas they're actually salespeople themselves, right? Right, like, yeah. Typically, they're entrepreneurs that have worked themselves up you know, from the sales floor to use car manager to general manager. So they know when they're being sold to, they understand all the nuances of sales techniques and tactics. So, you know, I had this opportunity um, with 
with Kijiji at the time. And I was, I had to reinvent the whole idea of what selling was. It mm. wasn't about, you know, this personal relationship. It didn't, that didn't, that didn't matter. I did all of the personal relationships and, you know, entertaining and, and it didn't bring me the level of success that I wanted in sales in terms of investing my time and getting it back. And I feel that I was very fortunate in terms of like the sales leadership that we had at the time. Um, Ryan Thompson, who, you know, um, he was able to, you know, put me on a path a lot, you know, put me on a path of, Hey, like, these are the books that you need to know to understand the dealership world, to understand the auto dealers. Here are some of the key blocks. I said, okay, this is really, this is really good. But then I started to go down and okay, Will, like, what did you do wrong? Why weren't you successful in your old role? Okay. We understand that, you know, entertaining and, you know, being this likable person didn't net you sales. So what do you need to do? So right. I systematically went through and looked at and did a lot of research on, okay, who are the top sales resources kind of that, that you can get books on, that you can listen to podcasts. And in a very short period of time, I consumed a lot of content, read a lot of books that allowed me to build a foundation of um, my new kind of sales regimen. And mm. a big kind of focal point of that was value, bringing value to your clients. And um, Bill Bird is one of the one of the authors that I read um, that really, really drove that home. And his um, law of reciprocation really stood out to me. You give without any expectation of giving back. Right. And when you start doing that, right, and thinking of how can I add value to this conversation because this dealership is talking to somebody in Ontario, in Toronto, they might be up in Edmonton, and they have never, ever, they do not know you at all. Right. Um, they've got a very limited amount of time. You know, retail automotive is very fast paced. You know, a general manager, a used car manager will get tapped on the shoulder on a phone call probably five or six times. So what can I deliver immediately to, you know, get their attention and show that there's some value in the conversation that we're going to have. And, you know, by backing that with the knowledge that I kind of immerse myself in, in terms of, you know, principles of how to move uh, metal in, uh, in retail automotive, um, and also doing a lot of research before ever reaching out to the client. So I had a feeling and understanding of their business before yeah. I ever spoke to them, before I ever talked to them. I probably knew more about what was going on on their Twitter and their Facebook than they would ever have a clue on, but you'd be able to key in on maybe certain things that were important to that business by doing that research beforehand. And you could drop a, drop a little bit of a, you know, a seed into the conversation that you were showing that you knew about their business, even though it's the first time that you had ever talked to them. Um, so that that's part of it. I think doing that, Leg work allows you to build value. And I think yes. another really, you know, important piece about building value is discovery. Asking questions, you know, yes. what's important to their business. And that has always resonated with me, Joel. It's yeah. the longer that I can hear my client talk, the better right. job that I'm doing as a salesperson. And when I look back on the, the majority of the conversations I had kind of post uh, beer rep, beer rep world, the, the majority of my conversations are asking questions and listening to what my client has to say. And by, by doing that, we know, and especially in my, in, in, in my business of retail automotive, these car dealers know that I'm going to try to sell them something. Right? Yeah. Like they, right. they've sure. got their guard up. It's a little yeah. bit, it's disarming when I'm the one who's interested of learning more about their business, understanding what their needs are, because at right. the end of the day, I've got a whole suite of different products and solutions that I can, I can, if I don't understand what your needs are and what you're trying to accomplish, 
I'm just like every other vendor out there. Yeah. So doing that research, that discovery allows me to bring in that value conversation of sharing, you know, the data, the insights that I have access to, but not without knowing what's important to that, to that client, to that potential customer. Because if I'm just getting up there and spouting, spouting off, uh, right. what, you know, whatever it is that I'm selling at the time, I don't really care. Like for me, it's a waste of, it is a waste of my time and yeah. it's certainly going to be a waste of my client's time. Right. <laughs> So much gold in there. <laughs> well, that's that's an amazing answer because when you were the likable salesperson and going to the hockey game, and I love the words you said, you know, and then they're miracle. Maybe maybe because they're going to like me, the miracle will happen, and they'll go, you know yeah. what? Well, I like you. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's get your beer on tap, and it's like swish. But the truth is, you you didn't elevate the conversation. So it didn't go past the likability. There was there was no value. There was no Added, value. There was no yeah. value in that. Well, there age. was a there was a value. You were they had a good time. <laughs> so there was you know that that's a value. Uh, you're likable, which you know is important. You you're you, to, to be honest, you're still taking that likability. You are a likable person. Um, and it's you're nice, still <laughs> no, you <it's> true. <laughs> it's obvious. Um. So you've taken that and go, now how can I be more strategic with that? And that is about, okay, I'm likable. So I've got that. So I can build rapport easily. I can connect with people easily. Um, and now, because I know I, I've already sort of got that trust, um, the second part is don't go into that conversation cold. Don't go in waiting no. for that miracle. Um, really have knowledge and and i can't stress how important that is no matter what you're doing um i have been so surprised that even at networking someone reaches out to me and says uh oh let's meet before this event uh or networking and they're like so what is it you do and it's like man i i looked you up <laughs> i figured out what it is you do couldn't you take a few minutes to figure out what it is that i do and, and so it's it's not a cold conversation. I and mean, right at the bat, I'm deflated. And so I can imagine that when you're calling in the dealers and you don't know anything about them, but as soon as you start saying, hey, I know this is what's going on in your world. And I believe this is what's, and I believe this is what's important to you. Uh, all of a sudden, and this is just human instinct. They feel that they've been understood. There's a connection. You're you're absolutely right, Joel. And they're, uh, I think Roosevelt, said it and he said it very well nobody cares about how much you know until they know how much you care right exactly and yeah. that uh you know i'm doing i'm doing some mentoring with with some younger sales people and i'm just constantly telling them all the time just slow down the yeah. most important piece is to understand your your clients right um and from that point on that's when you can start plugging in you know, value. I also, it's funny because, you know, even in this conversation, you know, I think that a lot of people, especially in the sales wor world, correlate value to something that's monetary. Right. I'm going to add value by giving something monetary, yes. which for a salesperson, well, why would you do that because that's cutting into your commission. That's cutting into your gross profit. Mm -hmm. The value that you should be adding and that your client actually cares about is your industry knowledge and what you know and what you can bring to the business because any company can discount to give value, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're doing, if you're doing that all of the time, then it just becomes about price. And if it's just about price, that the client cares about, then how, you know, how are you ever going to elevate the conversation with your client? Yeah. And then when another vendor comes along that has a better price, what happens, Joel? Yeah, nothing. There's no, there's no relationship. There's, yeah. uh, there's no loyalty. Uh, you're, you're just, you're just another business. You're just another person selling. And um, unless I feel that I, and, and well, and I've seen this with you that, you know, you, your clients go to you, not for a product, but sometimes even for advice or some coaching. The, yeah. the, 
this, the, and that is what the value is, is that you're, you're, you're bringing the expertise to them. You're helping them grow their business. And basically, that's what you're selling. You're selling growing their business, but it's not just the product, it's how you do it. And yeah. that's what I'm hearing. Also, yeah. the, the second thing is the key questions you ask. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to, um, you know, reflect back on what you had, you had just said. It's, I think about it on a daily basis. I would say about 80 to 90% of the calls that I get from my clients aren't about any product. Mm -hmm. It's, I have a problem. Yeah. I want to understand what this is, or I'm thinking about doing something. What's your opinion? Do you think I should do that? And that all comes from taking the time to get to know them, asking meaningful questions. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the fundamentals of sales and I, and it sounds cliche when I, as I'm saying it, but it's, you know, when you're going through that discovery, asking open-ended meaningful yes. questions that are based on the research that you have done to understand what their goals are, right? Yes. Where their struggles are, where their challenges might be. You then take that, you ingest that, you actively listen to them and then you come back, you, you say to them, you know what, I've, I've heard you, you know, points A, B, C, D. Um, I think that there could be some opportunities for us to work together. Would it be okay for me to come back next week and for us to talk about these? And maybe, you know, there could be some potential for us to work, to work together. Right. And I think framing things as a, as a partner. Yes. The client really values that. And it's different from how every, every other salesperson kind of does it, right? And yes. you don't, <laughs> I, th I think, you know, when we're trying to check all these boxes and, you know, value can't just be a buzzword for you as a salesperson, you have to live it and, and do it. And, you know, I, I love, you know, how we were talking about, yeah, we're just, we're just, we're <laughs> going to do this. And then miraculously, like all of this is going to come together in a right. sale. Yeah. I think that that's another misconception that I had as a young salesperson was that, yeah, we do this big pitch. We, you know, we go out, we entertain this client and then, right. you know, magic's going to happen. No, 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 no. Sales is not flashy. It's not showy. It's consistency and grinding and follow up and always being there. And, you know, as I, as I kind of went down this um, adventure of understanding what value is, so well, that's another piece of value that you bring as a salesperson is consistency. Mm -hmm. Hey, when I email Will, you know, you were asking me if I work on Saturdays and I do, yeah, yeah. but my clients know that if they reach out on Saturday, that they're going to, you know, it's not going to be the, the entire day, but I'm going to check in to make sure that things are, things are going well. If they've got a problem, I'm going to pick up. Right. And there, that's another intrinsic value that you can bring. The conversation is by doing what you're going, you say you're going to do being consistent and following up. And I think that that is really lost in, yeah. you know, it certainly was for me as I started in sales that, yeah, we're going to do a, we're going to do a big pitch. We're going to, we're, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get a big deal out of it. No, no, no. The pitch is a very small part of the process in terms of the sales cycle. It's, you know, the average sale is what, 10 touch points before you close a deal. I think that that's even on the, that's going to be on the low end because, you know, the sales cycle of my business is probably about three to six months. So we're talking mm. probably upwards to 20 to 30 touch points. Right. But that's also another layer of value, right? Is the consistency, picking up the phone when your customer calls, no matter what, like, if it's going to be a good call or a bad call that you answer, you treat them professionally and you deal with it as it comes in. I think that that's another level of value, uh, another layer of value that I didn't fully understand when I was, when I was young. And mm -hmm. that I'm going to continue to kind of teach to uh, younger salespeople that, you know, that I'm mentoring or that ask me for insight and advice because that goes a really long way in building that trust and transparency with your client. Yeah, I'll quote Fred Flintstone. Go yabba dabba do absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this because as you're saying this, I'm thinking, ha. Huh. Now, as as someone listening to this podcast, they might be going, mm -hmm. um, "Wow, that sounds like a lot of work." <laughs> so let me ask you this then, Will, because how 
because I think intrinsically, I think this is a, this is a, a your your own values or 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 how how did you make this important to yourself or or why is this important that you that you have that consistency and that you offer that value? How did you come up with that or or where do you see it in yourself or maybe in, in your own story? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I don't like losing, right? Okay. I I like I like winning, yeah, and I like and it's and it's not for you know the the kudos that you get from your coworkers or any kind of recognition it's in my mind um and in my heart that i know that i have checked every single box that i can when i'm going towards a task or a job or you know a sales target that i've done everything that i've humanly possible to get to that target and by you know my early my early lack of success in sales, I said, this isn't me. This is not, this does not feel, this doesn't feel right. Like that's exactly how I felt. I said, something is wrong here where the equation just isn't adding up for me. What am I doing wrong? And by looking back, doing that self-reflection and, and, you know, I, I guess a bit of it was arrogance that, yeah, hey, yeah, no, no, I'm, you're going to like me and I'm going to sell you shit. Like <laughs> it doesn't work. As, right. So that's where the value conversation came in. And, you know, um, the go giver, that's the book by Berg that, that okay. is about that law of reciprocation where, yeah, like my customer can buy from anybody. Sure. So why, what separates me? I they don't, they shouldn't really care about who I am as a person, maybe down the road, once I've built some rapport and trust with them, but what kind of value can I give them that nobody else can, right? And that is, you know, A, being successful, building an equation that I know is successful. Joel, mm-hmm. I know I know that this works. And I've seen it with salespeople. I've seen it with, you know, salespeople that I've mentored. Hey, honestly, I'm going to tell you that this is a lot of hard work. But if you do this and this, I can almost guarantee you that you'll be at the top of the leaderboard, but you can't cheat it because you're, yes. you're, you're right. I hear a lot of, you know, I hear a lot of like buzzwords like, Oh, a life hack or a sales hack and stuff like that. And I, right. they're all, they're all learnings that we can kind of get together, but there's no, there's no shortcuts in, in sales. Not if you want to be here for 20, 25 plus years, you want to, you know, mm-hmm. you want to be at the top of your, um, your sales org in terms of your targets, your commission checks. There's no shortcuts. You go in every single day, um, building building that value, having you know, having tough conversations. Um, it is a it is a grind, and there is no there is no shortcuts. And you have to you have to put in the work. You have to put in you know, like Gladwell says that um, <clears throat> in the outliers, right? It's that ten thousand hours. It's building up that yeah. Um, it's building up that, that base. And I said it the other day to, to, um, a sales rep, you're, you're like building up your sales kind of armor, your Teflon, Mm -hmm. um, from a very, you know, early age. And, you know, my hope from hopefully some, uh, some young, um, aspiring salespeople or even some seasoned vets, right? Like I, Mm -hmm. I are, are listening because it's never too late. No, what what I, (laughs) What I do, Joel, isn't isn't rocket science. It's you know, it's nothing special. It's about doing the fundamentals, caring about your customers, listening to them, and following up. That's that's what it is. Well, I think the value that you get out of this is, as you said, and this was the soundbite earlier, which is it didn't feel right when you were being yeah. showy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and what feels right actually, as this is what I'm hearing for you, what feels right actually is. Yes, it is a grind, um, but A, you like winning, but you also do like offering value, like that there's actually like, a, uh, and the value is that there's this trust, that there's a relationship, that, you, that you're offering an expertise, um, that you're not just uh, a number. I, I don't know how many times I'm approached by, you know, uh, hey, if we could offer you 10% off, and it's like, well, that's not a relationship. 
<laughs> it, how many times am I on LinkedIn? I get this all the time because the word coach is in my LinkedIn. And there's so many businesses that are selling to coaches and they know nothing about me. And the, so I see that I zero value because they're just talking about their product, um, but they're not actually working hard to learn a bit more about what is important to me. So that I think that that's at the heart of this is it it's, you know, you talked about the the book, the book, um, Go Giver, is that what it's called? The Go Giver, yes. The Go Giver, yeah. And reciprocity. Um, it's also one of the things about persuasion, which is uh, about reciprocity, that people as human beings, if you offer something, and more than just like a, a night out <laughs> to go see hockey, <laughs> but if you offer something that is actually of value to them, then they feel a connection, especially because that value is has a deeper meaning to it than just like one night at a hockey game as an example but yeah. there's like oh this is really i i keep thinking about what will said or i keep thinking about what will offered um so, so one one more question i have for you and, and then and then we're going to ask the the deep question on this feels right okay uh but one more question is you mentioned tough conversations yes so how do you because that's 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 you know number one. No matter what we're selling, whether we're selling a brand or selling a product, um, we know we're going to have that difficult conversation along the way, or just generally in life. How do you prepare? Or how do you deal with a difficult conversation? Yeah, that's a that's a good one, and and one that you know I don't think that any well maybe there is people that enjoy having difficult conversations. I might know some of them. <laughs> um, however, I think that I I. I think that the majority of people do not like having difficult conversations. No, no, no. Um, for myself, and this is something that I'm continually working at and trying to get better at. And the the one piece where this has gotten easier is dealing with things faster mm -hmm. and letting it build. And you know, I think back to earlier in my in my sales career and my sales management career where, you know, an issue will not go away. Yeah. The quicker that you identify what the issue is and understand what is causing that issue so that you can have the difficult conversation, the better it can, the better it can get to its outcome. And I say this on a, on a human level as well. Times when approached with, issues and difficult conversations. I think that I would build it up in my head bigger than what it actually was mm. where, whereas my um, method now is okay. You know what? Let's get on the phone. Let's have a meeting. Let's meet and let's talk it out. Let, let me help, let, help me understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. As opposed to letting an email chain go like 30 right. emails deep or, you know, text messages going back and forth. Hey, you know what? I understand. Um, this is what I'm understanding. And this is what I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get on a phone call or, you know what, what does your afternoon look like? I'll, I'll come and see you. And what that helps for me, at least, is that I'm not building it up in my mind. Yes. And I'm also help de-escalating, hopefully, the situation by engaging, recognizing, and hopefully moving it forward. I, I also think that as a, as a, a as a younger person, um, you feel that you need to solve other people's problems, mm. whereas maybe you just need to listen <gasps> and, and hear them out. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. I know Joel, uh, but I, I, I go back to it's, you know, those difficult conversations, it's the ripping of the bandaid off. Let's get it yeah. done. Yes. But the faster you have it, yes, the, the faster that it, that you get over with it. And by doing that and yeah. just thinking about it from like a human level, like, okay, there's a reason why we have to have this difficult conversation. Why is that? What is this other piece person feeling? And a lot of times I've diffused difficult conversations by making, acknowledging, and then making the offer. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to come and see you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come and I'm going to, you know, let's get on a phone call. Let's get on a, let's get yes. it on a zoom call. And the quicker that you can deescalate the conversation or the situation, the better it is for, for all parties. 100%. Well, 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 as you're saying this, all I keep thinking about is that 
difficult conversations are not miraculously going to go away. No, they are. They that's do not. The, that's the theme to this interview is that you <laughs> miracles don't necessarily always happen. And so with the difficult conversation, exactly what you just said, not only do you keep building it up in your head, but the other person keeps building it up in their head too. So the yep. longer you wait, the more the emotions continue to rise. So by you having the courage to be the adult in the relationship and go, okay, let's, let's, you know, I'm going to meet with you right now. And, but you know that if you take that first step, you're deepening that relationship even more because talk about reciprocity that you're willing, you're not hiding, you're willing to discuss it, acknowledge it. Um, and as you said, sometimes you can't solve it, but you can start by listening and empathizing with them. Um, and then maybe you're looking at the problem together instead of making each other the problem. You said it perfectly, Joel. <laughs> so let's, let's, I love that you said earlier about the, you know, question. So um, on the podcast, we always like to ask that, that sort of deep question, the sort of, you know, question that we would go maybe a little bit under the layer to find a little bit more about the person, create more of a connection. So are you ready for our deep question? That was my let's, deep voice. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, well, and it's not even that deep of a question on the surface, it sounds light, but let's see what it uncovers. Um, you've been in sales as it sounds like since you were 13. So like I was gonna say your whole adult life, but adult life plus your teen years. So if we were to wave a magic wand, um, what, what would you want to, what would that other career be? What, what else could it be? Yeah. You know, I, I love my, I love my career. I love, mm -hmm. I love my clients. I love what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, I think that, you know, if I was to do a second career, you know, if I was, uh, you get a, you know, a government grant to go on a, on a second career, maybe I win the lottery or something like that. It's always been something for me that was really important to serve my country. So a uh, couple pieces from like a young age, you know, I was in the army reserves um, thought I wanted to be a police officer. Life kind of happens and things change. But, you know, um, looking at that second career, I'd love the opportunity to actually be a, a border guard. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't often hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's probably not on a lot of people's list. But a, a couple of reasons for that is that I'm mm -hmm. from a small town, typically border crossings outside of, you know, um, well, even the major ones are in pretty small settings, right? right? Yeah. And being able to being able to serve um, serve my country is something that's um, something that's important to me. Oh, that is very it's very unique and, and very interesting about being a board of art, serving your country, not working in the police force anymore. Um, but a, another way to look at serving your country. That's I love that. So let me. So you said border guard. Uh, it gives me. Maybe, I have an ethical question for you then. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So it's me. <laughs> We've known each other for a few years. Um, I I'm crossing the border. <laughs> I got my family in the car. Um, and I just came across. I, I haven't been gone 24 hours. And and uh, you say you have anything to declare, Joel? <laughs> and I say, uh, no, Will. And then you see in the back all these bags from Target. Yeah, and great, you, great question. I, I would I'd first say, hey, Joel, it's great to great to see. You. I hope you had a great trip that was less than 24 hours into the into the United States and I'll just rewind a bit and I think mm -hmm. that this is one of the reasons why I feel that that you know that civic service is is really important because I feel that the people that are employed whether it be the police service whether it be um, you know border security um, our our bureaucrats that work in Ottawa and municipal and, and government is that we're hiring people of a high moral and, and ethical character. And that's the reason why we have, we've hired them, right? We're trusting in these people to serve and protect our Canadian citizens and, and also, you know, people, visitors to this country. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, and I've seen this, you know, I've got some brief experience. Um, I did a summer internship with the OPP doing Marine enforcements and some of the good officers that I worked with, they were given the discretion to make decisions um, based on, you know, their feeling um, of what the information was that they were getting from, from, from people. And that really, really stuck with me is that it's still, it's still, you know, the people's character is still very, very important in those roles and being able to assess and judge those situations. So 
after greeting you in a in a friendly manner, uh, Mr. Silverstone, with your mm-hmm. with your family, I yeah. would say, um, Joel, I do notice that there's target bags in the back of your car. Could you just tell me a little bit more about that? Is there anything that you want to share with me? Right, <laughs> and it's putting it back on you and giving uh, giving you the individual the opportunity to tell the truth, right? right? Yes. Because at, at the end of the day, the the role is to serve and protect. It's not to persecute, right? Or prosecute uh, for that yeah. matter. It's it's to give you the opportunity to tell me actually, actually, Will, you know what? Uh, my life, my wife loves um, um, this this butter that I get at Target uh, <laughs> because I have to make these runs myself. I forget what the name is um, okay. right now, but uh-huh. um, because we've got to do these frequent runs over to over to Buffalo or Detroit <laughs> to pick up this butter, and actually say, you know what? Actually, it's um, it's this uh, this butter that we can only get in the U.S. And you know what? I was just so I was a bit nervous because I was crossing the border and I forgot to tell you about it. For me, as that border guard, I would say, you know what? Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Mr. Silverstone, for for yeah. telling me the truth. You know what? It's great to have you back in Canada. Safe drive home. This ties into offering value and the deepening of the relationships. Being curious, I love that. You know, and it goes down to a feeling. Goes down, it feels right. Um, feels right. Um, because you, you, I love it. You turn it to me to to make the decision. Um, you're giving me. You're not making any assumptions. You're giving me the benefit of the doubt, and it's like. Uh, I'm. I feel really respected to do that, and it's probably that's a great way to demonstrate again how what value is is that you're giving respect to the other person, you're treating them, um, that they're able to make the the decisions, and you're not manipulating them to make the decisions. Absolutely. Well, what a great episode on offering value, um, and and how not how to say how to sell it, but really how to almost it sounds like how to design it. Um, and how to make it feel authentic and genuine, um, which I think is so important. So, well, if um, somebody would like to get some more information from you, where can they connect with you or find out more about Will Harris? Yeah, absolutely. Probably the best avenue. And I, uh, you know, I fully welcome any uh, any salespeople or any, you know, professional that wants to learn a little bit more about building value. Please feel free to add me on uh, LinkedIn. That is the, the best way to uh, get a hold of me. So um, feel free to reach out to me there. I'm happy to engage in, in conversation and hopefully give you a little bit of value from what I've learned in the last 20, 20 plus years of, of selling. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on This Feels Right. Thanks, Joel. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.